In this video, we'll be going over the best magic item weapons that are of uncommon quality or lower. Basically, early level magic weapons, because that's where the vast majority of D&D games actually take place. And at number 10, we have the Moon Touch Sword. This will be the only common item on this list because there isn't really good common weapons in the game. Basically, what the Moon Touch Sword does is, while you're in darkness, it sheds bright light for 15 feet, which is 5 less than the torch. However, it doesn't have the downsides of a torch, where you need to drop it as soon as combat starts in order to wield two-handed melee weapons, or to have to constantly relight it or environmental concerns from holding around a fire. So it's like a sword flashlight. However, the benefits of the Moon Touch Sword is that it technically counts as a magical weapon. So it gets past resistances and immunities that a lot of monsters have. So if you're going up against a ghost that's resistant to all non-magical weapons, then with the Moon Touch Sword you can hit it like normal because it's technically a magical weapon. This is definitely the least impactful magical weapon, but it's not the worst one though. Surprisingly enough, there are some weapons that are straight up detrimental to your character, which the Moon Touch Sword is not. So it's only at number 10. If all you care about is having a magic weapon in order to overcome resistances, the Moon Touch Sword does its job well, as well as providing light. And at number 9, we have the plus one greatsword slash maul. Now, a plus one weapon counts as uncommon quality and are definitely the most tame of the magic weapons because they do provide a nice bonus where you get a plus one to your attack rolls and damage rolls with those weapons, but most of the good magic weapons will have this property on top of something else. Adding this to the list, though, gives us a great baseline. The strongest plus one weapons you can get are the Great Sword and the Maul because both of them deal 2d6 damage die and giving it a plus one equals around eight damage on average. So in order for an uncommon weapon to deal some great damage, it has to be able to be at least an 8 damage on the average threshold. And at number 8, we have the Storm Boomerang, which is a weapon from the Princes of Apocalypse module. Now, what this boomerang does is when you throw it and hit a target, the target will take 1d4 bludgeoning damage and an additional 3d4 thunder damage. And then the target needs to succeed a DC 10 constitution saving throw or be stunned until the end of its next turn. The boomerang uses the proficiencies for javelins, so that weapon users can add the proficiency bonus to the attack roll, and it returns to your hand if it misses like a normal boomerang. Plus, it has a pretty respectable throwing range of 60 feet, up to 120 feet at disadvantage. So its damage, if added together, equals around 10 average damage, which is slightly higher than the plus one greatsword, which is only 8. However, once you deal its thunder damage, it loses the ability to deal that thunder damage and stun a target, until it spends at least one hour inside an elemental air node. So if you don't have access to elemental air nodes, you're basically only able to use this weapon a single time in its intended way. However, if you can recharge it, it's a pretty good weapon. The chance to stun is kind of low, honestly. A DC 10 isn't hard to beat, and most monsters have high constitution scores. So the chance to stun is really good, but even without the stun, its damage is higher than baseline, for that one attack anyway. And at number 7, we have the Blood Spear, which is a weapon from the Curse of Strahd module. The Blood Spear is basically a normal magical spear, the special effect that if you use a spear to reduce a target to 0 hit points, you gain 2d6 temporary HP. So every time you down a creature, you gain around 7 average temporary hit points, which is a pretty decent amount at early levels. That could be like half the HP of most low-level player characters, especially since there's no duration on the temporary hit points. So the temp HP granted by this weapon lasts until they're used up, or until you finish a long rest. So that's an excellent buffer on damage. There's also an additional property to the weapon, where if the creature wielding the spear is chosen by a specific character named Kaven, then it gains the benefits of being a plus two weapon. And an item gaining the plus two benefits is equivalent to becoming a rare quality weapon. So if it becomes of the equivalent of a rare quality weapon, it still technically does less damage than a plus one greatsword but has a higher chance to hit. And even without being a plus two weapon, the temporary hit point feature is really good. It makes all this list for that feature alone, especially since the feature is not limited. You can keep killing creatures to refresh that value. Although just remember with temporary hit points, you can't stack temporary hit points. So if you keep reusing the feature and you have some left over, then it just gets set to whatever the new value is. And at number six, we have the insignia of the claws. Now, technically this isn't a weapon, but it only gives you weapon-like benefits, so I decided to count it for this list. This is an item from the Tyranny of Dragons module, and it's a trinket that, while you have it, grants you a plus one benefit to your unarmed strikes and natural weapons. So if you're a monk or a druid in wild shape, this grants your normally unmagical attacks the magical weapon property. 
which allows you to bypass resistances. Normally, monks and druids need to be high level in order to gain this benefit, or some of them just don't gain it at all. And because nearly all high level monsters are resistant or immune to non-magical weapons, this item is actually super useful even at high levels for characters that can benefit from it. And at number 5, we have the Sky Blinder Staff, from Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. This is a plus one magical quarter staff, which also grants the person holding it a plus one bonus to spell attack rolls. So in addition to being a magical melee weapon, granting a plus one to your attack rolls, it also carries over to your spells, which is pretty useful in an uncommon weapon. It also has a pretty niche reaction ability, where if a flying creature within 30 feet of you tries to attack you, you can use your reaction in order to force that attack roll to be at disadvantage, and also make them perform a DC 15 constitution saving throw, or else be blinded until the start of their next turn. And if it's under the blinded condition, then all of its attacks will be at disadvantage for that turn. But it also gives all of your allies advantage on their attack rolls against the creature thanks to that blinded condition. And there's no limit on how many times you can use this reaction feature. So you just get it once per turn, essentially. But the limitations on this really good reaction is that it only works on creatures that are flying, and if you never encounter flying creatures, then you'll never be able to use it. It's pretty niche, but there are a lot of flying creatures in the game, so it's not that niche. And definitely a benefit of the staff, which has pretty decent stats for a spellcaster even if you don't use that reaction feature. And at number 4, we have the Staff of the Adder. This is a staff which requires your bonus action to convert the head of the staff into a poisonous snake for one minute, which you can then use your action to make a melee attack with that snake. That deals 1d6 piercing damage, and if the target fails a DC 15 constitution saving throw, they take an additional 3d6 poison damage. So if you add those two damages together and average it out, it's around 14 damage on average with each attack, which is definitely higher than a plus one greatsword. However, if the target does succeed the saving throw, then the damage is kind of mediocre. Now, normally constitution saves are terrible to target on monsters, but a DC 15 is pretty reasonable. That's a higher spell save DC than most low level players have, and it's not half bad in tier two and tier three levels of play either. So you can reasonably expect a creature to fail that saving throw more often than not. There's also a small downside to the staff, where technically the snake head can be attacked and it only has 20 hit points, and if it ever drops to zero hit points, then the staff is destroyed. But if you just kind of ignore that, this is an excellent damage on a melee weapon for classes that can use it, as it can only be attuned to by a cleric, druid, or warlock. And at number three, we have the Javelin of Lightning. This weapon has a feature where once per day, you can throw that at a target up to 120 feet away and speak its command word. And all creatures in a line between you and the target take 46 lightning damage on a failed 13 dex saving throw, or half as much on a success. And 46 lightning damage is around 14 damage on average, the same as a single hit from the Staff of the Adder. In addition, the target you're actually throwing the javelin at takes the normal damage of the javelin, which is 1d6, plus 4d6 lightning damage. So the main target will take 17.5 damage on average, which is definitely the highest damage of all the items on this list. The Javelin of Lightning can only be used once per day in this way, but it has a lot of AoE damage if you're able to hit more than one target with its line. And even if you're only hitting a single target with it, deals more damage than everything else on this list. The only sole limiting factor of this weapon is the fact that you can only do this once per day. So, during one single combat, it's incredibly good, and then it just becomes a normal magical javelin afterwards, which is only useful for overcoming resistances of monsters. Although, that one burst of damage is really good, which is why it definitely takes a high spot on this list. And at number two, we have the Weapon of Warning. This is a magical weapon, which can be any weapon your DM chooses, and basically what it does is just warn you of danger. While you have the item on your person, but you don't need to be holding it, you gain the benefits of have an advantage on your initiative rolls, and you and your companions within 30 feet of you can't be surprised, unless you're literally incapacitated by something other than non-magical sleep. And if you are asleep, the weapon will magically wake you and your companions up if any of you are naturally sleeping when combat begins. So Weapon of Warning basically makes it so you and your allies are immune to surprise during your first round of combat, which is basically a condition that makes it so you can't do anything during the first round of combat, if an enemy creature has a stealth roll that's higher than your passive perception. And what's excellent about Weapon of Warning is its AoE protection. If a single person in your party has a Weapon of Warning, then your entire party is better off for it. There's very few weapons or items in the game that give your entire party a really good blanket protection effect like this, to the point where this uncommon magic weapon is useful in high levels of plays as well. 
And some legendary or even artifact items have special properties that copy the benefits of Weapon of Warning because it's so good. And Weapon of Warning would normally have taken the number one spot on this list if it wasn't for the actual number one spot maybe being kind of a little bit overpowered. And at number one, we have the Moonsickle from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. More specifically, the plus one variant, which is Uncommon Quality. This item counts as a plus one sickle, which is a pretty weak, simple weapon that only deals 1d4 damage if you actually use it to attack with. And this item is only usable by druids and rangers. And the item has the properties that in addition to being a plus one weapon, it also grants a plus one bonus to spell attack rolls, and a plus one to the saving throw DCs of your druid and ranger spells. And this is the really powerful part of the weapon. Items which increase your spell save DC on your spells are incredibly rare, and generally only on very rare or legendary items. And the only items which increase your spell save DCs below super high rarity items are generally ones that only affect very specific classes, which this item falls into. And being able to increase your spell save DC at all is really good. Because spells are kind of balanced around the fact that you almost never increase your spell save DC outside of the standard way of increasing it through either your proficiency bonus or an ability score modifier going up. However, in addition to this excellent spell save DC increase, it also has another effect where if you cast a spell that restores hit points, you can add an additional 1d4 hit points to that amount restored. This effect is very similar to the Disciple of Life ability that Life Domain Clerics get, which restores extra hit points to healing spells as well. So on top of having a really good stat increase, you basically gain a defining feature of another subclass. Although, it's not as strong as Disciple of Life. The healing bonus from the Moonsickle only applies when you cast a spell, and not when you just use a spell, which is a distinction that only really matters for long-lasting spells like Goodberry or Healing Spirit. So, the Life Domain feature does increase the healing of Good Barrier Healing Spirit, but the Moon Sickle does not. In Yu-Gi-Oh terms, the Sickle would miss the timing on granting that extra healing to Good Barry, because it needs to happen when this spell is cast and doesn't apply later on. But the Disciple of Life ability does provide increases, so it's all technical rule jargon. I made sure to double check this when researching the video. But basically, if it did affect Good Barry, it would be even better than it already is. But as is, being able to increase the healing of a healing ward by 1d4 is like doubling the amount of healing from its first level spellcast, which I might add, is on top of the weapon already being good without this feature. The Moon Sickle might not be the best when it comes to dealing damage, but when it comes to providing really good features, it's kind of overpowered to an extent. Which is why it definitely takes number one spot, because it's technically a weapon. Now, this list is mainly about weapons which could be useful to martial classes, so it's kind of weird to put a weapon that's definitely not useful to martial classes at the number one spot. But it's just so useful to the classes that can use it that it really outshines the other uncommon magic weapons in below. Although the rest of this list is already full of a whole bunch of really good melee martial weapons, so you have a lot to pick from in case you're only using this video to decide which weapons you want for a martial class. Alright, and that's the video. If you think I missed anything important or got something wrong, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. And also, if you have any ideas for future videos similar to this one, make sure to mention them as well. This video idea was taken directly from a comment on a previous video going over all of the best magical weapons in the game, which you should check out if you want to see the absolute top of the line when it comes to these kinds of things. And of course, if you're one of the 60% of people watching this video who's not subscribed to the channel, my editor gets really mad if I don't ask you to subscribe, so if you could, that'd be pretty nice.